Hello everyone, this is Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and other platforms. And if you want to help keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. So in accordance with the results of a recent Twitter poll, I will be doing the next Myth of the Month on feudalism. And I have a lot to say about that. I've learned a lot, but I want to round out my research. So that should be coming hopefully next week. <clears throat> but this week I'm going to pick up again on a subject that I left off a long time ago, which is the so-called scientific revolution. And if you listen to that first lecture, part one on the scientific revolution, alchemy and apocalypse, I left off in the 1650s, this time of tremendous ferment, of social conflict and uncertainty, and also of great apocalyptic enthusiasm, as all sorts of states were at war, revolutions were happening, England was in the middle of an interregnum with no king on the throne, and there was this great excitement for the new learning for pan-sophism, the idea of collecting all knowledge from the entire world and bringing it together in some kind of central group or club or circle. There was talk about an invisible college in London. And especially a lot of this kind of frenzied exchange of ideas was moving around in a sort of triangle between Bohemia, what's now the Czech Republic in Central Europe, Sweden, and England. So that was the, the kind of triangle of ferment, you could say, in this moment in the mid-1600s. In the 1660s, things start to shift, and people start actually creating formal public institutions to try to channel and formalize this pansophical excitement. And also the geographic center starts to shift away from Sweden and Bohemia, although Sweden remains significant. They start to shift more towards these major growing Western imperial powers of Britain and France. So that includes England and also later on Scotland to a growing degree, which is brought into this United Kingdom with England in 1707, and also France. And the colonies too, the overseas colonies, especially in North America, start to be drawn in more and more. So the landscape starts to change, and with that a lot of the ideas and practices of these natural philosophical schools start to shift as well. So the most important new formalized network that starts to try to organize this sort of mission for pansophical knowledge, mastery of nature, is founded in 1660 in England, and it's the Royal Society of London. And this is a very significant, pivotal moment in England. 1660 is the year of the Restoration. So that interregnum, that time of uncertainty, of conflict, when there is no monarch, when censorship is abolished and all kinds of radical ideas are exploding forth, all of that kind of calms down, you could say, when Oliver Cromwell has died, his son is unable to govern, and so Prince Charles is invited back across the Channel to England to take up his throne as Charles II. And there's something of a kind of reaction, at least in some ways, in some senses, a reaction, a return to normalcy, you might say. And a lot of what the Restoration regime does in the 1660s is tries to take a lot of these kind of kooky ideas that had been going around in the 1650s and tries to kind of contain them and institutionalize them in a way that's easier to monitor. And they do this, for example, with the Royal African Society, which is chartered to try to control the growing slave trade. And when it comes to pan-Sophism and this excitement for natural philosophy, the avenue for that is this royal society, which brings together a lot of important experimental philosophers like 
Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, Elias Ashmole, many of whom had been experimenting in alchemy and angel communication. Boyle had this long quest to communicate with angels and find out prophecies and the secrets of nature. Well, they were sort of brought together into this more respectable grouping of the Royal Society under royal patronage. And then other similar groups followed, like, for example, in France, the Académie des Sciences was founded in 1666. So you start to see this this sort of radicalism take a more uh, respectable institutional form, but still this kind of enthusiasm for discovery, for prophecy, revelation, continues to drive people outward. And there's even an idea frequently brought up to create a new academy, a new pansophical kind of global academy, not assigned to any one particular kingdom like England or France, in America, somewhere out there in the Americas or the Indies. And so in the 1700s, there was the formation of a, a new network that wanted to create a university like this, some kind of pansophical university in Bermuda, that English-held island out in the Atlantic near America. And the very noted philosopher George Barclay, who was Anglo-Irish, actually went to America to try to drum up funds and support for this Bermuda group. And this was, you know, not an entirely new idea. For a long time, America had been seen as a place of great possibility where these hopes for a new age, a new dawn would be realized. And it goes back, at least you could say, to Francis Bacon and his fantastical kind of, you could say, science fiction novel, The New Atlantis, about an academy on this secret island out in the Atlantic called Ben Salem. So this sort of enthusiasm and these kinds of dreams did continue, but the main apex of this new world of natural science and this quest to systematize new knowledge was really the Royal Society in London. And these luminaries were very important and attracted attention, but a lot of them, like Hook, were also good organizers. They were good at holding meetings and compiling journals and getting their work published and putting things into this reliable institutional form. And the Royal Society did a lot of the critical work, really, of codifying the idea of an experiment. So people had been doing experiments for centuries, especially alchemists, you know, trying out different materials, mixing them together, heating them up, freezing them, setting them on fire, and kind of seeing what would happen with the hope of creating something of great value like gold or the elixir of life. But the Royal Society started to shift and adjust the meaning of an experiment. And more and more, they focused in on controlling conditions, setting up a set of predictable, measurable conditions like light or heat or pressure and subjecting things to these conditions in a tightly controlled way in order to see what would happen with the supposition then that under the same conditions you should get the same results. So with this social and institutional evolution of the experiment, they, in often in unspoken way, shifted their assumptions, the underlying metaphysical ideas of what they were doing and why. But I'll get to that more later. That change in underlying thinking was really exemplified and crystallized, most of all, by Isaac Newton, who actually was of a younger generation than these luminaries like Boyle and Hooke and Ashmole. Isaac Newton was born in 1642 and received an excellent education and showed that he was kind of a wunderkind, a polymath who could master all kinds of fields. And he joined the Royal Society in 1672 when he was only 30 years old. So that was a big honor for someone so young. And pretty quickly he emerged as the kind of new leading light 
of the second generation of the Royal Society and loved to apply mathematics to these questions of the heavens and motion and light and all these things that philosophers had been grappling with and arguing about for centuries, going all the way back to Paracelsus and Galileo. He loved mathematizing these problems. And a lot of that, it seems, was for mystical and religious reasons. So he continued to subscribe to a lot of these old ideas of not only pan-Sophism, but neoplatonic, Kabbalistic mysticism. And he, he studied Kabbalah, this sort of body of mystical analysis of scripture that had been developed mainly by Jews and then also passed on to Christians. And he really wanted to apply his mathematical skills to scripture, to the search for hidden meanings in the Bible. And that, it seems, was really the major enduring obsession of his life, really. And these sort of natural philosophy pursuits were were kind of secondary, but that's where he made his big mark. He very early on connected optics to mathematics and tried to analyze how, for example, the different colors of the spectrum could be related to one another through mathematical ratios, depending on how they refract through different media. Uh, he also built upon the work of Galileo and Kepler in their studies of motion and of the heavenly bodies. And he was the first really to add in dynamics to not only try to uh, deduce what were the mathematical models predicting the motions of the heavens, but also what were the forces, what was pushing and pulling on these bodies on earth and in the heavens, causing them to move in the way they did. And all of his sort of copious work of trying to uh, describe phenomena mathematically was then collected in his great magnum opus, Principia Mathematica, which was published in 1687, when he was 45. And the most impactful part of Principia Mathematica is simply his three laws of motion, where he just takes up the work that Galileo and others had already done, analyzing and describing the motion of objects uh, falling or rolling or launched through the air. And he argues that all of these phenomena can all be described according to three simple laws. Objects in motion tend to remain in motion. So here he's kind of flipping the script, you could say. Instead of saying, when you throw a javelin, the question is, what keeps it moving after it's left your hand? Which is the question that Aristotle had tried to answer. Instead, he flips it and says, no, we should assume that that is what will always happen. The question is what stops it. And that's where the other two laws come into play. So secondly, force equals mass times acceleration. So this one is a little mathematical formula. If things that are in motion tend to remain in motion and things that are at rest tend to remain at rest, well, then what causes that to change? What makes something start moving or stop moving? Well, any change in motion you can call acceleration. And that, you know, if, it, if it's speeding up, going off in some direction, or turning, or comes to a halt, all of that can be called acceleration. And things only accelerate when a force acts upon them. The greater the force, the more the acceleration. But the greater the mass of the body, the more force it takes to achieve that same acceleration. So you can also say the, the acceleration of a body is directly proportional to the force applied to it and inversely proportional to the mass. And lastly, every action leads to a reaction, an equal and opposite reaction. So if you fire a cannonball at a wall and the cannonball strikes the wall and cracks it, likewise the wall is also striking the cannonball. And the cannonball is either going to change shape, it's going to deform, or it's going to bounce back. Any time a force is applied, it's going both ways and having an equal and opposite effect on both bodies. 
So basically, with these three laws, you can pretty much describe every motion that you see in the world all around you on, in, on earth or in the heavens. And he makes it explicit that these same basic rules define everything, whether it's in the mundane world or in the sky. And that was a pretty radical argument, considering that all of these philosophers up to Galileo and even after Galileo's time continued to say that the heavens are essentially different. They're somehow pure and perfect, and they do not suffer change in the way that things on earth suffer change. So to say that change and cause and effect work the same way in both realms is to kind of flatten the universe, right? To say that there's there's nothing essentially different about things we see in the sky like the moon and the stars as opposed to things like feathers and bowling balls. And in order to bring this whole picture together, he argues for a force, an invisible force called gravity. And he puts forward a law of universal gravitation, which also has a mathematical formula to it, but basically it just says every body of any kind everywhere in the universe attracts every other body. So why is it that when you let go of a rock, it falls down to the ground? It's because the earth as a body is exerting gravity on the rock. Why is it that we see the moon moving around the earth? And that is what was generally accepted by this time. The moon goes around the earth because the earth is pulling on the moon. And the moon constantly accelerates towards the earth by bending its pathway and hence goes in a circle around the earth. And likewise, that's why the earth goes around the sun and so does Jupiter and so on. Every single body is just a hunk of mass attracting every other hunk of mass, depending on how big it is and how far away it is. Newton's arguments were very striking and powerful and gained a certain number of followers and admirers, but it did not win universal acceptance, not then and not for a very long time. There were a number of issues that Newton's arguments brought up that many people were uncertain about or that caused them to completely reject his whole theory. A major one was action across a distance. If you accept his notion of universal gravitation, then you have to suppose that the Earth is exerting gravity upon the moon thousands and thousands of miles away. And for that matter, so are you. Your own body, small as it is, is exerting some gravitational pull on Jupiter or the sun. How can that happen? How can bodies that are not touching each other act on one another with forces? What is the medium? What is the connection that allows distant things to push or pull one another? This struck many people as mystical and, and magical, a kind of fairy dust superstition. And especially people who continued to give some credence or put some confidence in the old Aristotelian model of the world. This just sounded like moony, mystical madness to them. So there were many who rejected or resisted his arguments. How friendly you were to Newton's theories often depended a lot on your religious or political views. For instance, there was a slowly growing school of thought, especially among the highly educated intelligentsia, in England and France and a few other places that we can loosely call deism. And that's a term that has been thrown around a lot. It's often misused or misapplied. But basically, we can say there was a growing notion promoted by some in the Royal Society or their friends and allies, a notion that the entire world worked by sort of regular clockwork it was like a great machine, and that God did not actively intervene in the world to do things like perform miracles. So God instead was abstract, passive, absent, and had simply set up the universe to work according to certain patterns and then withdrew from it. 
So people who subscribe to this kind of viewpoint were much more likely to like what Newton was saying. Others were alarmed and disturbed by the implications, especially if they were afraid of this slowly growing deistic school of thought. And something I've written about myself a bit is how in the myth of the Enlightenment, people today often put together different English thinkers and cast them as sort of great founding fathers of deism and the Enlightenment, when in fact they had radically different views. And in particular, they'll often point to Newton and Locke as sort of the two heroes, the sort of Romulus and Remus, founders of the Enlightenment. But in fact, Newton and Locke were really frenemies at best. They had a certain degree of respect for one another as great thinkers, and they spoke to one another usually politely, but also sometimes fought and said very nasty things about one another, especially privately. Uh, it was very catty. And Locke's big concern was that Newton seemed to be a deist, that he seemed to think that the universe itself was this sort of perfect creation and all you have to do is understand it and then you understand God. Whereas Locke was deeply committed to scripture and to learning God's will and God's nature from divine revelation. So this is what they fought over, as well as different, deeper epistemological issues. Newton was very suspicious of Locke's epistemology and, and believed that Locke was actually even attacking religion by denying the idea that things have essential properties. So we don't have to get deeply into that, but Locke is an example of someone who really was very wary and suspicious of Newton and his possible covert religious agenda. So all through the 1700s, after this initial splash by Newton's Principia, there was a long struggle between different competing theories and metaphysics of the world. And Newton and his ideas were just one contender in this kind of ongoing battle. And there were all kinds of rivals and challengers to Newton. It was not as if people woke up from reading the Principia Mathematica and said, oh, Newton got it right. Now we're in the age of Newton and science. Not at all. It was a very, very slow shift, and people all through the 18th century really didn't know where it was going to go. And there were other philosophers that we rarely ever mention today, like the bishop William Warburton and the Anglican priest William Law, who also put forward theories of the world, of natural philosophy, that were much more... Uh, metaphysically complex, that were often mystical and involved hidden spiritual bodies and spiritual forces and essences. Both of them drew a great deal on the German mystic uh, Jakob Burma, and in turn on this kind of older 16th and 17th century school of mystical Neoplatonic philosophy and the idea that things were connected by their symbolic resonances or sympathies, things that looked similar were connected to one another because of their, their meanings. And that, that sort of mode of thinking really did endure and continued to compete with Newton and Newton's physics. And there was a continuing interest in astrology, uh, the correspondences between constellations in the sky and limbs of the body. Physicians continued to search for the so-called weapon salve, a drug that you could apply to the weapon that had caused a wound in order to heal the wound. Something that sounds totally nutty by today's standards, but seems to make sense to many people all through the 16 and even into the 1700s. So Newton and his physics and his sort of simplified mathematical model of the universe continued to be controversial it only gained ground very slowly over the course of the 1700s, and ultimately only after 1800 was there really a widespread consensus, you might say a scientific consensus, around Newton and Newton, Newtonian physics, as we call it now. 
So if there was all this resistance and skepticism around Newton and his physics, why did it ultimately win out? Well, there are a number of reasons. One is the sort of political reason. So remember, as I said, Newton joined the Royal Society in 1672. So just 12 years after it had been created, and he was a sort of new young mover and shaker. And at that moment in the Restoration, this kind of a philosophy, the idea that all things in the universe obey one set of rules, that bodies revolve around one another, everything is drawn towards the sun and hence revolves around it, and the moon is drawn towards the earth and so revolves around the earth, it seemed to put the world into a kind of nice, simple, predictable order where bigger things are the center. And this could be appealing if you saw it as a kind of parallel to politics and to the idea of a single sovereign, a single leader or ruler that everything revolves around. And people made those comparisons a lot, especially in the 1700s. You see depictions of, say, King George II on ceremonial silver, showing him as a sun with planets revolving around him. And sometimes people who weren't even monarchists used these same sort of metaphors. You know, when American jurists argued for the supremacy of the Supreme Court, they would describe it as the single center of all authority in the judicial system that emits light that the other lesser courts then reflect. So they're repeating this sort of notion of the world, the social order as a kind of solar system. So Newton could be very appealing to people who wanted to promote a sort of unified, predictable social order. And the Royal Society could serve that role. You know, the Royal Society was the meeting place, the contact point between the world of natural philosophy and the crown, royal authority. It could serve their interest as an institution to embrace this philosophy that seems to be consonant with stability, order, unity, as opposed to those earlier roots in the interregnum and the civil war, this time of chaos and revolution. There's also the fact that Newton's simple mechanical metaphysics seemed to work. For one thing, it fits with just good old Occam's razor, the simplest explanation that makes the fewest assumptions but accounts for the evidence should be taken as the true explanation. And that was simply a point of view that had been widespread and prevalent going all the way back to William of Occam in the 1300s. So it has that kind of comprehensibility, simplicity. It was widely circulated. Even people who didn't have formal schooling, women could read it, discuss it. And it fit with this new sort of simplified set of underlying metaphysical assumptions that I referred to earlier, that the Royal Society increasingly was embracing. So if we look at the edition of Principia Mathematica that was published in English in 1729 rather than Latin, Newton included with it a short essay kind of explaining and justifying his method, which was called The Rules of Reasoning in Philosophy. And a lot of it is kind of abstruse, that might might be kind of hard for us to understand today, but it includes three rules that were simple and quite sweeping, and that probably can be understood to kind of articulate and encapsulate these new, the new mindset and the new assumptions of the Royal Society and their readers and supporters, but that hadn't necessarily really been laid out explicitly up to that point. So if we look at the, this text in English from 1729, the first rule Newton puts forward is, quote, We are to admit no more causes of natural things than such as are both true and sufficient to explain their appearances. So there may be more there than meets the eye. For one thing, it's like Occam's razor, just applied to physical phenomena. 
you know, you don't have to make any more assumptions and impute any more causes than is necessary to explain the observation that you've made. You know, it's just like Occam's original formulation. It is vain to do with many what can be done with few. It also contains, there's an element there that's begging the question. We are to admit no more causes of natural things than such as are both true and sufficient. Well, in reasoning and philosophy, we're trying to determine what's true. So it's sort of begging the question to to say, you know, only believe things that are true. <laughs> but it seems you can say he's he's just creating a an attitude, a way of observing phenomena in the world in a way that adheres to this broadly accepted philosophical approach. Rule two, quote, therefore, to the same natural effects, we must, as far as possible, assign the same causes. So if you're seeing the same effects somewhere, you should suppose it's the same causes. Okay, seems to make sense. But notice that there are a lot of assumptions built in there. For one thing, the, the idea that causes and effects have regular unchanging relationships. The same cause will lead to the same effect every time, everywhere, no matter what. And hence, if you see the same causes, you should get the same effects. And he illustrates this rule. He gives examples and illustrations. And Newton says, quote, As to respiration in a man and in a beast, the descent of stones in Europe and in America, the light of our culinary fire and of the sun, the reflection of light in the earth and in the planets. So he's bulldozing over all kinds of barriers and distinctions that previous philosophers, including Aristotelian philosophers, and Neoplatonic philosophers too, would have made. The idea that, for instance, humans and beasts are essentially different that they're different orders of creation. Newton is saying, no, no, no. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a human or an animal. If it's respiration, it's respiration. It works the same way. The descent of stones in Europe and in America. Now, that's a very revealing example, too. The same causes that make a stone fall here in England should also be making stones fall over there in America, which happens to be a place that England is colonizing. So there's a great promise here in saying the same causes and effects happen anywhere in the world, any location in the world. That means if you figure out a technique, if you build up knowledge from observation and experimentation here at home, say in England, you can then apply that knowledge abroad, over in America, maybe where we have colonies, or vice versa. Something that you learn about the body or about the earth or about weather over there abroad in faraway lands, you can bring that knowledge back here and use it. So this is a way of thinking that is very appealing if you are, say, for example, starting to build an empire and you want to gather knowledge and exercise power. The light of our culinary fire and of the sun. So now he's saying phenomena on earth are the same as what we see in the heavens. Once again, right, no distinction. If you see it happening here on earth, you see it happening out there in the heavens. And he drives that home again with the last one, the reflection of light in the earth and in the planets. If you see light bouncing off a mirror in your living room, that should be the same as the light of the sun bouncing off the planet Venus. In a way, this second rule is massively liberating. It's saying we can figure things out anywhere and apply them anywhere, not only anywhere around the globe, but even beyond the earth. Suddenly, our knowledge, our ability to, to understand the world, gives us this limitless power, this limitless insight and power over everything. It's a great, you could say, imperial philosophy. And he follows through with this then again with rule three, the qualities of bodies which admit neither intention nor remission of degrees, meaning they're unchanging, and which are found to belong to all bodies within reach of our experiments, are to be esteemed the universal qualities of all bodies whatsoever. So this, you could say, is a kind of endorsement of inductive reasoning. If you're seeing things happen 
in bodies around you, behaviors, qualities, traits, you can suppose they apply to all bodies of all sorts everywhere, unless you see evidence to the contrary. So there's this great expansiveness of, of his philosophy. Now, notice that if you subscribe to these rules, there are certain things that you have to throw out, things that previous philosophies would have taken very seriously as very important, like who is performing this experiment? How trustworthy are they? What's their state of mind? What's their spiritual state? Alchemists used to suppose you have to be in a kind of pure spiritual state to perform a successful experiment. Otherwise, it's going to go wrong. Well, now that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's doing it. It also doesn't matter where they're doing the experiment. It doesn't matter when. All of these things, the, the, the season, the alignment of the stars, none of that matters. Also, symbolic connections. The notion that uh, you can that a plant in the shape of a tooth will have a special effect on a person's tooth if they come into contact with it because there's some meaningful link between them. All of that has to go out the window. Symbolism, spiritual meaning, sympathies, all of that is gone. And this is the sort of implicit assumption that the Royal Society really had been building up over many years before this edition of Principia Mathematica was published in 1729. They had gradually ruled out those other factors. And more and more, they came to believe that only certain types of conditions of an experiment actually matter. Things like temperature and pressure and light. Those things actually matter. Not, is this being performed by a spiritually enlightened person? Is this happening while the sun is in the house of Aquarius or whatever. All of that stuff can be thrown out. And there's no necessary rational reason, to put rational in quotation marks, there's no necessary logical reason why it should be that temperature or pressure matter to the behaviors of bodies, but time of year doesn't. It may seem that way to us now because we have seen the fruits of Newtonian physics and we can understand why certain things like temperature and pressure actually cause a rock to explode, whereas the alignment of Venus and Mars don't. But that is not a logically necessary conclusion. It's something that had to be built up over many years of experimentation and observation before it was then articulated, eventually by Newton. So you could say, in a way, this essay on rules of reasoning and philosophy is kind of backwards. It's not really a set of basic a priori or self-evident assumptions that you have to have in order to do experiments. Rather, really, it's the result of experiments. It's the outcome of this socially cooperative work that had been going on, particularly in the Royal Society for decades, that this is the set of rules that they eventually found to work. Now, just a little brief note from that, Many of you are probably aware that today sciences are in a so-called replication crisis where people have done thousands upon thousands of studies and experiments more or less along the lines that Newton and his colleagues prescribed. And they're finding that actually it doesn't seem to be true, <laughs> that if you set up the same experiment again according to the exact conditions described in the report, you're going to get the same results. We are just now starting to grapple with the degree to which even in physical sciences, like chemistry and physics and biology, the sort of controlled conditions that we think ought to make our effects and our observations predictable really don't work so well and that things are a lot more random and unpredictable than we thought, there's something going wrong with this set of norms and systems that are supposed to give us reliable results. And that's just in the so-called hard sciences, in quotation marks, let alone the social sciences, 
which some would argue are a massive category error, that there's a mistaken notion that setting up controlled experiments in imitation of Newton or Boyle's or Hooke's experiments in physics and chemistry will give you predictable results in the same way if you apply them to human behavior. But, you know, that you could say is kind of the replication crisis times 10. Okay, well, putting that aside, this is the mentality that had been developed in the Royal Society among their members and their supporters and their correspondents in places like the French Académie des Sciences or in Sweden or in North America. What were these results? What were the sort of results people were getting from this kind of experimentation, whether before or after the creation of the Royal Society? Well, there's a big fact here, a large overarching fact that we have to recognize first, which is that when we look at the classic scientific revolution from about 1500 to about 1700, this time period that people usually tend to talk about as the scientific revolution, very little actual invention or innovation happened. Very little. There are very few useful, applicable discoveries that came out of that period. It was, as I said before, it was a time of confusion and epistemic free-for-all with the old Aristotelian view of the world breaking down and all sorts of confusion and disputation about how to describe the world instead. So it was a time of shifting in thinking. It was not a time of great innovation. And it was only really after 1700 that you start to see more and more frequent actual inventions where new natural knowledge could be applied to something practical. So this is part of why I really think that the if we talk about the scientific revolution, we have to at least extend it through the 1700s, if not into the 1800s, up to the time when this style of experimental philosophy was actually gaining traction and wider following and was helping to spur on actual inventions that affected people's lives. So if we look at the different fields, the different fields of endeavor and knowledge where people were trying at least to come up with innovations, there is really only one where there were significant new inventions made in the 15 and 1600s in that sort of classic scientific revolution period. And that field is optics. And it seems that that happened not because there was some great new insight, but because there were better materials. So people had been experimenting and trying to study light refraction and reflection, at least back to Roger Bacon in the 1200s. But there was a huge leap forward in the 1500s, mainly because some Venetian glassmakers were able to produce better glass, denser, stronger glass that could be fashioned into more powerful lenses. And this allowed for the creation of the telescope. We don't know for certain who made the first compound telescope. It might have been some random Venetian sailor, but we know Galileo made one, of course, which allowed him to make all kinds of new astronomical observations. Uh, Von Leeuwenhoek in the Netherlands created the first microscope in the 1590s to blow up and observe close up tiny bodies like cells. There were new studies of refraction and color, the color spectrum, by Newton himself and also then by George Berkeley that other philosopher in the 1700s who tried to organize the new academy in Bermuda. And this sort of improved lenses and optics, they led to towards an improved astronomy, an observation of the heavens with much closer and more precise measurements. And people had long been interested in the heavenly bodies because of astrology, because of the idea that the heavens had some kind of hidden occult influence on events and life on Earth. But with the Copernican Revolution, so by the late 1600s, the educated community had really accepted the Copernican model, the notion that 
bodies revolve around one another, and the planets and the Earth all revolve around the sun. But they didn't know, although they accepted that idea, they didn't know the dimensions. How big are these planets? How far away are they? How big is the sun? How far is it? What are the different orbits of these planets? They didn't have a detailed model of the solar system, but they had the opportunity to figure that out if they could observe specific astronomical events, particularly the transit of Venus. So Venus occasionally passes in front of the sun from our point of view on Earth, only very rarely, every few centuries. But there were two transits of Venus in the years 1761 and 69, and people went to great lengths, built enormous reflection telescopes, went to far-flung sites around the Earth in order to take observations of these transits and hence use them to figure out what were the relative sizes and locations of Venus and the Sun. And once they knew that, then they could calculate all the dimensions of these different bodies in the visible solar system. So in this way, with the, the better optics, what had been astrology developed and evolved and refined into what we now call astronomy. But astrology never really went away, right? There continue to be many people, not professional astronomers, but there are many lay people who still believe, even though they know this better physics of the solar system, they still believe in astrology. So in this way, the optical improvements led to a new sort of discipline and form of knowledge we could call astronomy. But really the greater obsession of the 16 and 1700s was not astronomy, but the manipulation of fluids and gases. So many of these leading lights that I mentioned in the Royal Society, like Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke that I mentioned before, were alchemists. They were more or less open about that. And alchemy involved trying to manipulate materials with with heat and chemical reactions to try to transmute them. And that didn't necessarily get them very far. You know, alchemy tended to be a losing endeavor most of the time. But they were able to refine more precise ways to manipulate fluids, especially gases, and to try to discern the different forces and energies that moved them and to try to channel them. And Boyle actually created an air pump, which he would suck the air out of and try to create a vacuum, which in itself was a controversial idea. Not everyone really accepted that that was possible or that it could work. But nonetheless, using his air pump and with other experiments, Boyle was able to deduce what we now call Boyle's Law the notion that that the volume of a gas changes depending on the pressure and the temperature, and that higher temperature leads to higher pressure and hence expansion. There's a whole mathematical, describable mathematical relationship there that you can apply really to any gas. And this sort of improved knowledge of fluids and gases and heat did lead to more and more inventions after 1700. For instance, in 1709, the first hot air balloon, so really the first human flight, was a hot air balloon created in Portugal in 1709, right? Just drawing on this idea that hotter air will be more expansive, less dense, and hence will rise uh, and can lift things up as they rise. Just three years later, an English mechanic, Newcomen, created the first steam engine, a machine powered by the rapid expansion of water into steam as it heats up. And this led eventually to pressure engines, right, enclosed chambers where that enormous force of expanding steam can be channeled out to drive a powerful engine and hence eventually to steamboats, and then later in the 19th century to railroads. And a French philosopher, Antoine Lavoisier, was able to isolate oxygen 
in 1772. So figure out what it is in the air that actually makes fire and combustion possible. So more and more, these inventions were built off of this better understanding of how to manipulate fluids such as water and gas and steam and what sort of elements, you could say, worked and interacted in chemical reactions like fire. And these discoveries became more and more useful by the end of the 1700s. And they then, of course, were yoked to new machines like spinning machines to process textiles. And hence, they made possible really the Industrial Revolution, the creation of mass mechanization to process wool into cloth, which was always the major industry in Britain beginning from the late Middle Ages and the enclosure movement and this effort to get human tenants off the land and replace them with sheep to feed into this enormous wool industry. So it was this this evolution from Boyle and his experiments with the air pump up through the creations of steam engines that on the one hand led to the Industrial Revolution and on the other hand created another, a second new field of philosophical knowledge, which we call physics, right? So improved optics leads to astronomy. Experiments with air and steam lead to physics. And also in a similar vein, all kinds of philosophers, and I'm still calling them philosophers because they were not yet called scientists, and this field of knowledge was not called science. It was called natural philosophy or experimental philosophy, Many experimental philosophers in many different countries also found that they could experiment in interesting ways with the manipulation of electricity. So people still had no good explanation of what electricity was. There was a lot of confusion and debate. What is an electrical spark? What is an electrical charge? What is lightning? Is is lightning electricity? Is it just a big electrical zap? It was really unknown, and there was a growing fascination with electricity and the sort of mysterious power of it, and many people created generators, little machines like a a little engine that would turn a glass bulb and rub it against a cloth in order to build up electrical charge, which then could be discharged with a powerful zap or spark. This sort of thing became very common. There were people like Ebenezer Kinnersley and then later Benjamin Franklin who went around different towns in England and the colonies performing these bizarre experiments and demonstrations with their electrical generators. But Franklin was the one who really cast in his lot with the idea that lightning is electricity. And that in the same way that Newton argued the same laws of motion that apply to objects on Earth also apply to the heavens, so things that you do to channel electrical sparks in your little engine, in your demonstration room, should also work with lightning. And he created the first lightning rod in 1752 to actually actively attract and channel the electrical current coming from a lightning strike. So this was one of a number of things that Franklin did that made him into a new superstar, right? Along with his work in optics, creating bifocal lenses. And many fans who spoke and wrote about Franklin at the time often compared him to earlier alchemical sages like Bernard Palissy in France or Paracelsus the traveling physician that I mentioned in the first lecture about the scientific revolution. So many people perceive Franklin partly because he comes from the colonies. They perceive him as this sort of rustic, primitive sage uh, revealing the secrets of nature out there, you know, in the woods, even though he lived in a sizable town, Philadelphia. But he sort of builds on this continuing fascination with America and this connection between pansophical wisdom revealing the secrets of nature and the kind of undiscovered mysterious realms in America. A fourth field, so alongside improved astronomy, 
manipulation of gases, manipulation of electricity. A fourth field of advancement was the study of living organisms, particularly the collection and categorization of all sorts of living things, plants, animals, fungus. And people in the 1700s really approached this massive field of of new knowledge with this kind of obsessive desire to order and control the things of nature by categorizing them and figuring out their relationships and connections. Uh, The great hero of this was Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish philosopher who was sponsored and supported by the Swedish crown and traveled around finding specimens. But there were others, again, especially in the colonies, people like Cotton Mather, the Puritan theologian and minister in Massachusetts who became the first colonial member of the Royal Society. So this was a big marquee moment for the colonies, that one of their own was becoming a member of that most elite philosophical club in London. And he would send specimens and reports about rocks and plants and strange old artifacts found around New England. Uh, Codwallader Colden, one of the wealthy magnates in New York, was an obsessive collector and categorizer of specimens. William Bartram, who went down to Florida in the early 1770s and was the first to draw and catalog all sorts of strange specimens like alligators that English people had not seen before in the tropics. And many of these natural philosophers, whether they were in the colonies or if they traveled around to Africa and the Pacific, Joseph Banks traveling through the Pacific, many of them often got important knowledge about living organisms and their properties and their behaviors from indigenous people, right? from Native Americans or Pacific Islanders. And they would process this into their sort of obsessive taxonomic language and often report it back to places like the Royal Society or the Académie des Sciences, while conveniently leaving out right? who was actually giving them this knowledge, who they were learning it from. So there was an imperial dimension, right? The the gathering and categorizing of knowledge was a kind of, you could say, Baroque imperial venture. But there were, of course, major questions still left open that people were really not yet equipped to tackle, such as how and why do all these various forms of life come about? Why are there so many different kinds of plants and kinds of fish and kinds of beetles? Uh, Was there some single act of creation? Is there some force, some hidden force that shapes creatures into their form? Is it accidental? And how are traits passed on from an organism to its offspring? How is it that a beetle lays an egg which hatches a beetle of the same type? So all of these things were still left in doubt, right? This simple project of observing and categorizing was really the order of the day, and this was the first foundation of what we could call biology, right? So we're seeing how in a very haphazard and unforeseen way, these new experiments and these new endeavors were leading to what we would now call physics, astronomy, biology, and then finally, geology, So people still did not have a good grasp on the earth, right? This was another enormous mystery. Why does the earth look the way it does? Why does it have these features like oceans and continents and mountains and volcanoes? And it was really in the 1600s that certain philosophers first started to think that the earth can be studied as a thing with a history, almost like an archaeologist going and excavating at a place like Pompeii. Similarly, can you examine and even dig into the earth to figure out how it formed and how it took the strange shape that it does? And are there events that can account for how the earth came about in the way that we encountered it? In one sense, you can say that the great forebear or forerunner of geology was a Danish philosopher 
named Nicolaus Steno, who was employed at Florence in the mid and late 1600s. And the irony is that Steno's training was as an anatomist. He was a student of life forms, right? Part of this early project to examine and describe and classify all the living things. But something that struck him was when he was asked to dissect a specimen of a shark in order to get a more clear, accurate picture of how this frightening and rarely caught animal actually worked. He dissected the shark and he noticed the teeth of the shark and he was able to put together that many of the rocks that people found in the hills and mountains in Italy and brought to their collections or their museums were actually identical to the shark's teeth. Now, this in itself was maybe not necessarily so shocking because something that people had known for a long time also was that you could find seashells, fossilized seashells, spirals like anemone shells on hilltops and even mountaintops in Italy. So this was was not entirely new, right? And there were earlier philosophers such as Athanasius Kircher, who was a great Hermetic Neoplatonic philosopher in the 1600s, who tried to explain this phenomenon. And they argued that there was some kind of hidden force that emanated from the earth and that caused stones or hard objects of one sort or another to form into round or spiral shapes in imitation of the earth and its motions. So it's it's sort of in line with this doctrine of sympathies, right, of different objects relating and acting on one another because they're somehow similar. So this was the Kircher explanation. Why is it that you can go on a mountaintop and find what looks like a seashell, just the same as if you pulled it out of the sea? And it was because of this sort of uh, hidden power of the earth acting on all kinds of bodies on the land and in the sea. But how would that apply to a shark's tooth? A shark's tooth is not round by any stretch of the imagination, right? So this set Steno to thinking that, in fact, these things that look like seashells and shark's teeth are on the land because that land was once under the sea. And these heavy objects had simply floated down and accumulated on the seabed. And then something, some force, lifted the seabed up, maybe pushed it up out of the ocean and into the air. And hence you find these relics on the tops of mountains. And he even speculated that whatever this force is, maybe it's something violent and sudden, and hence it causes mountains in particular to rise up out of the sea. So Steno was the first to suppose that, in fact, the earth in this way has a history. There must be some sort of events that have happened in the past that have caused the surface of the earth to change and to take on the peculiar shape that we see today. And he started doing experiments in order to try to figure out how particular rocks or rock formations came about. He, of course, observed sedimentary rock, right? Rocks with many layers. And he theorized that those layers came about because there was a series of repeating events over a long stretch of time that created these layers one by one. And then he tried to figure out what those events were and how they created rock layers. And he was able to do experiments that showed that when you uh, shake up a bunch of sediments, a bunch of gravel and stones and sand and dirt in water and then let it settle, what you get is a layer where the biggest rocks and particles accumulate on the bottom and then the smaller stuff on top. And hence, when you look into sedimentary rock out there in the world, in each layer, you should see one side that has the chunky, gravelly stuff, and then the other side should have the finer sand and silt that's settled on top. And hence, you can tell 
the direction in which the rock had formed, how each layer had built up one on top of the other. So he started to create this sort of method and language for reading the history of features of the earth. Now, Steno was also devoutly religious. He'd been raised Protestant, but he converted to Catholicism. But this was the biblical century, and he wanted to fit what he was learning and observing together with the Bible. And so he theorized that many of these features of the earth that seem to have been caused by some cataclysmic event maybe were actually related to the Great Flood, as described in the Bible. But he did not... He was not entirely wedded to that hypothesis. That was a notion that others had put forward, and he tried to reconcile what he was observing with that flood myth. But nonetheless, it was very significant that he was trying to... He he ultimately threw out this sort of Neoplatonic theory of sympathies as an explanation for rock formations or land formations or fossils like shells and shark's teeth. Rather, he believed there was an explanation in historical cause and effect, that discernible events like storms or floods or earthquakes ought to produce certain recognizable, identifiable effects in the world. And the earth is, you could say, a kind of text with a history that you can discern. So Stano's ideas were then taken up by other philosophers in the 16 and 1700s and used to learn more about the, the behavior of the earth, how the events in the earth and on the earth create the land formations that we see. But there wasn't really a great advancement until the late 1700s when a philosopher in Scotland named James Hutton, took up these problems and collected together all kinds of data and information from different parts of the world and first put forward a series of lectures at the University of Edinburgh that argued that the earth was deeply, immeasurably old, that there had been cycles of change, of creation and destruction over and over again, over millions of years. And hence, the earth was far older than a sort of plain reading of the Bible could allow. And these processes that kept repeating over and over for millions of years could be expected to continue to repeat for millions of years. So this sort of first blew up the deep understanding of the deep history of the earth, far beyond what anyone could fit with any sort of written history, the Bible or otherwise. And so this development from Steno to Hutton can be seen as the birth of what we now call geology. So all of these fields, astronomy, physics, biology, geology, we today put them into our textbooks under this heading of science, right? But even still, even in the late 1700s and early 1800s, people were still not necessarily grouping these things together under this heading of science. They were still seen as developing fields of philosophy, right? The pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of wisdom. And there still continued to be some metaphysical confusion and disagreement right up through the 18th century, there was not a clear consensus about how, what science is and how it should work and who is a scientist. That would only come later. There also were spheres of what we would today call science that were still stagnant and really made no significant progress between the 1500s and the 1800s. A big one is medicine. <laughs> there was disagreement, confusion, conflict between Paracelsian alchemical medicine, which I talked about last time, and Galenic medicine, which revolves around the four humors. The, these schools of thought were still out there in circulation. There was no real resolution between them. There was some improved 
study based on experimentation and observation, particularly in Scotland, also in the Netherlands around a physician named Borjava. There was a sort of new growing Borjavian school, which at least taught probably some better techniques. There was a little progress there, but really no significant breakthroughs, nothing like what we would consider today to be proper medicine based on sound biology and sound understanding, scientific understanding of the body. There was some experimentation with vaccines starting in the 1790s, but it was very haphazard and really didn't catch on until much later in the 1800s. And all kinds of things that we think of as basic, like antibiotics, didn't come online until the 1900s. So it was a mostly a stagnant field through the 1600s and most of the 1700s. And what little progress did happen was around Borjava in the Netherlands and also, as I mentioned, in Scotland. And after the Acts of Union, when Scotland was integrated into the United Kingdom, the Scottish universities really became more and more of a center of this new experimentation. They had better medical schools and training. They had eminent new philosophers putting forward radical ideas for the time, like Adam Smith and David Hume. And you had people like James Hutton, this great innovator in geology. So a lot of what we think of now as science, in quotation marks, really only came together after 1800, when there was finally a pretty firm consensus around Newton's physics and around the idea that there should be some single set, simple set of mathematically definable rules governing all of these different phenomena, the earth, the heavens, the body, light, heat, gas, all of these things should fit under basically the umbrella of what we would now call physics or Newtonian physics. And Scotland was a major center of that change, but that really only came in the 19th century. This was not, it's again, it's not as if Newton walked into the Royal Society in 1672 and everyone said, aha, now we've got it, we've got science. And something I pointed out myself in my dissertation is that even as late as 1802, you can see instances of Freemasons holding lectures and orations in their Masonic halls and using the word science, scientifical advancement, the scientific labors of the lodge, with no connection at all to natural philosophy, nothing about physics or chemistry. Rather, they were using science to mean esoteric ritual. So the word science at root just means a highly developed skill or practice. And that could mean mystical meditation. It could mean religious ritual. It could mean natural philosophical experiments, right? But that idea that science is this special form of knowledge built around these shared practices exemplified in universities, in research universities, that really only came about after 1800. So thank you so much for listening to this lecture about the scientific revolution, which never happened, but this was a lecture about it. And as I said, I hope to do a myth of the month about feudalism. should be interesting. And if you want to hear all of my work, including myths of the month and the history of the United States and 100 objects, the installments that are patron only, you can have access to if you become a patron at any level or any amount, even if it's just a dollar. Thank you.